Signorina be taking lunch? Lunch? Oh, yes, thank you. The next coach, Signorina. Luncheon is not being served. Yes, please. Ah, uh, there is not a table for one, I'm afraid. Would the signorina mind sharing, perhaps? Uh, this gentleman, if the signor would be so kind. Oh, it's you. Ah, we meet again. <laughs> Delighted to see you. Uh, uh, Keller's the name, Joe Keller. I'm Laura Hart. How do you do? Um, look, before we go any further, I must thank you again for helping me this morning. Oh, that taxi driver you used. <laughs> yes. oh, think nothing of it. I know those guys of old... Uh, your English ones are wonderful. But the eye ties can be grasping. You're telling me. <laughs> Incidentally, what did you say to him? Nothing that a young lady should hear. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I'd better tell you a little bit more about myself. Um, I'm from Galsworthy, Pennsylvania, and I work for a newspaper. Well, I'm from England, as you know. I I'm just travelling abroad for fun. Well, actually, it's a sort of convalescence. Nothing serious, I trust. I had my tonsils out. <laughs> Doesn't oh. sound bad, I know. But they were rather large tonsils. The surgeon who cut them out said they were the biggest he'd seen this year. Well, what do you know? And where are you for? For? Oh, I I'm going to Lienz. Oh, that's fine. So am I. We'll be able to see something of each other. Um, have you made a reservation yet? Um, no, I, I don't need to. I'm staying with my brother. He's vice consul. Ah, Corps diplomatique, is he now? Well, Charles is only a vice consul. That's almost the lowest thing you can be. He comes under the British consul in Innsbruck, and he's under the ambassador in Vienna. Is that so? And and you are uh, are you travelling for pleasure too? No, I'm not. No, uh, like I said, I'm a newspaper man. I move around looking for things to happen. When they start happening, I start sending cables. A special correspondent? No, no, not as important as that. I'm on a roving commission. I have a nose for trouble. My editor thinks I have, which amounts to the same thing. The fact is, I had a piece of luck to start with. And that's what matters in the newspaper business. You remember what Napoleon said? <laughs> he said such a lot of things. <laughs> he said he liked lucky generals. Same with editors. My editor calls me Lucky Joe. He tells the other boys all you got to do is watch where Joe takes his vacation. Something's bound to happen. A race riot, a revolution. I don't claim to be responsible for Castro, but I happened to be in Cuba when he took over. It can't all be luck. The first time, perhaps, but after that, I expect there was a good deal of judgment in it, too. Or oh, maybe I have got a nose for trouble. Scusi, signor. What? Ah, uh, just the man I want to see. Um, would you like an aperitif, Miss Hart? Lovely. Um, a dry martini, please. That makes two of us. Uh, due martini, prego. Due. Si, signor. You know, it really is a coincidence, both of us going to Lienz. I bet you hadn't heard of it till your brother was posted there. I still muddled it up with Lintz, even after he'd been there for some time. <laughs> I don't suppose one person in 50 could tell you where it is offhand. It's an important little place, though. I'm going to be more important still if this trouble in the Tyrol develops. The bit of trouble your nose is leading you to this time. <laughs> That's right. You know, the real trouble in the Tyrol is the Nazis. Nazis? You mean Austrian Nazis? I mean German Nazis. The old died in the wool Heil Hitler gang. Plenty of them left in Germany. But what have they got to do with the Tyrol? Any sort of trouble's their business. And the Tyrol's their favorite sort of trouble. German speakers being oppressed by foreigners. Are the Italians oppressing them? Uh, depends on your point of view. The Italians say they're just governing them, maintaining law and order. The Germans say they're discriminating against them. And they don't like it particularly as there are about twice as many Germans as Italians. What's actually happening? The Germans are blowing up pylons and railways. The Italian federal police are trying to stop them. There's been quite a lot of shooting, and there are one or two pretty ugly atrocity stories filtering out. What atrocities? By whom? Well, they say by the Italian police, on suspected terrorists. Or on innocent peasants, according to your point of view. How does Lienz come into it? If I had a map, you'd see the answer to that. Um, let's see if I can demonstrate. Um, now, if you're coming south from Innsbruck, you come through North Tyrol, as far as the Brenner. Now, that's the gap between the two spoons. After that, you're in South Tyrol. The Brenner's the Austro-Italian border. And that's where all the trouble is? Right. But if you go east from the Brenner, which you can't because there are too many mountains in the way, but uh, come a bit further south to Brixen, which the Italians call Bressanoni. Mm -hmm. uh, that's the pepper pot. And then go east. 
you'd get back into Austria. Austria sticks down a lot further there. Now, that's the new province of Lienz. But what's special about it? I mean, lots of countries jut out into other countries. Well, what's special about it is this. Lienz is pretty well cut off from the rest of Austria. There are two ways in. One's up the Drava from Villach. And that's not much of a road. It doesn't really lead into the main part of Austria. The main roads from the north, that's over the Gross Glockner, one of the highest main roads in Europe. And it only needs one good fall of snow to block that. So most of the year, an Innsbrucker who wants to get to the Jens goes over the Brenner, which is always open, and through Italy. And now he can't. Well, he can, but it's very much more difficult. When the trouble started, Italy imposed special visas and a lot of new restrictions, tightening up customs formalities and so on. If the situation gets worse, they may close the Brenner altogether. Then Vianz is out in a limb. I see. That's why a few months back they handed them over a bit of autonomy. Uh, they control their own land as police and security now, and communications. It only needs one real incident on either side of the frontier, and the situation could go up in smoke. Ah, here are our drinks. Cheers. Cheers. So far, I've been Boschetto. Your stuff was safe where you left it three years ago. Money, passport, and gun. Getting tired now. And a long walk to Lienz. Well, here goes. Mist lying on the meadow. So much the better. More coffee, Laura? No, thank you, Charles, dear. I've had an enormous breakfast. Oh, it's wonderful to be here. It's such a lovely morning. I'm glad to see your op hasn't spoiled your appetite. Always were a guzzle guts, weren't you? Truly brotherly remark. Are you going to your old consulate now? Yes, must, I'm afraid. <clears throat> I'm glad you're feeling all right, though because we're going to have a rather crowded programme. We've got Herr Humboldt coming to dinner. He's the Hofrat. Goodness. He accepted the invitation some time ago. Though I fancy he'd like to get out of it now. Why? Well, he's got rather a lot on his hands. Bundesminister Franz Miller, roughly the equivalent of our Home Secretary, is coming here from Vienna tomorrow, bringing a cardinal bishop with him. He's a local boy from the Tyrol. The militia's turning out in force. The bishop's going to bless a new set of colours, which Miller will present to them. It'll be the biggest show they had in Lienz for years. Oh, your invitation card for the parade, by the way. How grand. Guest of the diplomatic corps. Mm. What's this big red bird at the top? Looks like an eagle. Or is it a dove? Oh, a bit of both, I'd say. Humboldt's bringing Helmut Angel. Who's he? Well, he's a good climber. He drives a French racing car very well indeed. And he has a chance of being in the Austrian team for the international winter sports. In England, I suppose, he'd be described as a playboy. You're not trying to put me off him by any chance. Heavens no. You're old enough to make up your own mind about people. Oh, now, I must be off. You're sure you'll be all right? I should be fine. I'm going for a walk this afternoon. Don't go wandering off into the mountains. I wasn't intending to wander any further than the nearest shops. What's wrong with the mountains, anyway? Your Frau Rosa said much the same thing when she brought my tea this morning. Well, a regular succession of people, mostly English, go out for walks on the mountains here and just don't come back. What happens to them? They are usually found at the bottom of precipices. Oh, how awful. Well, don't worry, Charles. I shan't run any risks of that sort, I promise you. And how do you like our Tyrol, Miss Hart? Lovely, what I've seen of it, Herr Humboldt. You have chosen the right moment to visit us. That's just what I told her, Herr Humboldt. You have a name for this season, haven't you? I mm -hmm. can't quite remember. Well, we call it the Bellamanswoche. Oh. The bellman is the old man who goes round after the feast is over, cleaning up the tables and snuffing the candles. Oh, yes. But when the bellman has finished his work, when he has extinguished the last candle, the snow will come. 
I hope I shall still be here. I love the snow. Are you a skier, Miss Hart? Not really, Herr Uncle. I've skied a little. I like it, but I fall down a good deal. Oh, everyone falls down. You know, I once fell head downwards into a crevasse and hung there supported only by my skis. I thought that only happened in comic papers, like getting hitched up on a pump pole. <laughs> there was nothing comic about this, I assure you. I hung there for more than an hour. In the end, I succeeded in wriggling out of the bootstraps, and then I fell. Yeah. Fortunately, I landed on a ledge not too far down. Then I climbed out. It was a lesson. A lesson? And not to go into the mountains alone. You're the third person today who has warned me against the mountains. Both my brother and his housekeeper seem to think I should wander off into them and never be seen again. You should not disregard the warning, Miss Hart. There are wild men in the mountains. They live in caves like beasts. Occasionally, we have a drive to clear them out, but they live close to the frontier and have only to cross it to be safe. Many of them are Italians. There was that woman tourist only last February, the one they found under a rock. I apologize, Charles. It's not a very pleasant conversation for the dinner table. <clears throat> uh, how are your preparations going forward for tomorrow, Herr Humboldt? Uh, they are complete. Do you anticipate trouble? There will inevitably be trouble, Mr. Hart. Trouble with crowds coming to and from the square. Trouble with traffic, with the extra security measures we shall have to impose. The safety of a Bundesminister and a Cardinal Bishop have been entrusted to us. No, I really meant racial trouble. I couldn't help noticing a slight increase of rowdiness. You know, slogans on the walls, that sort of thing. There's a subversive Italian element in Lienz. It is small, but troublesome. I have sometimes suspected that it receives support from our political opponents. Have you really got a troublesome Italian minority here, Herr Humboldt? What do you mean, Miss Hart? I meant... The national minorities sometimes get blamed for a lot of trouble that has nothing to do with them. Really, Laura? Well, they form a sort of useful whipping boy. Uh, or a scapegoat. Mm -hmm. How long have you been in Lienz, Miss Hart? Um, well, exactly 26 hours. And in your 26 hours, you have come to the conclusion that we have not got a troublesome Italian minority. It just occurred to me that the Italians might be having their own troubles, too. And when did this thought come into your mind, Miss Hart? About two hours ago. I happened to see an Italian being beaten up by three Austrians. It was horrible. They cornered him in a little dark alley and kicked him and jumped on his feet. I heard him screaming and I told them to stop, but they just laughed. Hmm. Did you report the incident? I told the first policeman I saw, but he didn't seem to want to take it very seriously. He discouraged you from making a statement? No, I wouldn't say that. And did he invite you to make one? Yes, as a matter of fact, he did. And you refused? Yes. He said it was probably apprentices or students. He evidently thought I was exaggerating. Yes. <clears throat> uh, coffee in the next room. Sorry, Charles. I can see I'm not cut out to be a diplomat. But you must admit he provoked me. I thought you provoked him. He treated me as if I were a child. Well, he's got a lot on his mind just now. Such as what? Well, there really has been trouble over the South Tyrol, and it could turn quite nasty. What I don't understand is who's making the trouble. South Tyrol belongs to the Italians, yes? Well, it doesn't belong to them. It was awarded to them after the First World War. They were on our side in that war. But they were against us this time, so why didn't they have to give it back? Well, the only people they could have given it back to were the Austrians. And they were on the losing side, too. I think it's horrible trading countries across tables as if they were counters. Uh, I'm going to bed. I suppose there's no truth in the rumour that the trouble's being stirred up by ex-Nazis? I don't think so. Who put that idea into your head? An American called Joe Keller. I met him on the train. He has an infallible nose for trouble. Told me so himself. Hey there. Miss Hart? Oh, it's you, Mr. Keller. Good to see you. You going to the parade? Yes, I'm meeting my brother there. Uh, join me in a cup of coffee first. I'd love to, but, but do you think we ought? It's due to start at 11 and it's 5-2 now. Ah, oh, it's a full-dress military shebang. There'll be half an hour of forming line and marching and counter-marching before business begins. Um, you've got a ticket for the VIP seats, I guess. Row C, wives and ladies of the diplomatic corps. And I have a press pass, so that's all right. 
Plenty of time for a cup of coffee. Uh, let's sit outside. Make the most of the sun while it lasts. Mm, yes. Uh, waiter. Uh, zwei Kaffee, bitte. Ja, my Herr. Stroop. It is lovely out here in the sun. Not a cloud to be seen. Not in the sky, no. Why, do you think... Oh, good morning, Herr Uncle. Good morning, Miss Hard. I shall see you at the parade. Certainly. Well, the speeches will be dull for you, but it will be a fine spectacle. Sorry, I didn't have time to introduce you. Oh, that's okay. I have a feeling I know that guy anyway. Helmut Uncle? Of course. Mountain climbing, ski jumping, racing cars. You know, all the really expensive ways of breaking your neck. If you have a lot of money to spend, that sounds quite a healthy way of spending it. Oh, sure, sure. A great boy. Miss White Cafe, my dear. No, thanks. Um, sugar? Thank you. He's, um, interested in politics, too, I'm told. Helmut is. What sort of politics? Does the, uh, Tiroler Boden Bund mean anything to you? Or the name Bergizel? Nothing at all. I don't even know who Bergizel is. Oh, fame, oh, fame, how short thy span. Short as the memory of man. Bergizel was a battle. Oh, dear. It was one of the greatest victories ever gained by irregular troops over a regular army. It's a place near Innsbruck, a sort of a tea garden now, where Andreas Hoffer, of blessed memory, routed the Bavarian and French troops. Is he the gentleman with the beard? They've got all the statues on. That's him. And when did it all happen? Oh, 150 years ago, just about. Oh, well, you couldn't expect me to know about a thing like that. People around here know about it. They've got long memories in these parts. Whenever something happens which they regard as a threat to the Tyrol, the historic Tyrol, Andreas Hoffer burnishes up his arms, and people like your friend Helmut either join the Bergizel Bund, which is respectable, or the Tyroler Bodenbund, which is more fanatical. Really? Well, he isn't my friend. I, I met him precisely once at dinner last night. Ah. All the same, I could hardly help liking him. He was such a pleasant contrast to our other guest. Who was he? Herr Humboldt. The half rat? That's right. Well, now, what I wouldn't have given to be there. Now, that's a man who's come a long way in a short time. And knows it. Mm. How did he get to Lienz? Oh, it's an old rule of politics. When a subordinate gets ambitious, you send him off to rule a distant province. The Romans thought that one up. Sometimes it works all right. Out of sight, out of mind. Sometimes it backfires. The proconsul gets up such a head of steam in his own province, it blows him back into power in the capital. He didn't strike me as the sort of man who'd be likely to make a mark in history. How come? Well, <laughs> he's such a little man. <laughs> Most of the trouble in this world has been caused by small men. Napoleon was five feet two. Hitler was five feet three. Oh, hey, we better be moving or we'll miss the parade. building opposite must be the palace. Where's the map he drew for me? Oh, yes, here it is. And that quaint-looking affair on the right with the little turrets, that's the state theatre. Looks more like a castle. There's old Humboldt on the platform, stiff as a poker. Bishop's a fine-looking man. How becoming white is with the Red Cardinal's hat? He looks like a very tall candle. Speeches. I wish my German was better. Here goes Humboldt now. Liebe Einwohner von Jens, wir sind heute stolz und glücklich, unseren hochverehrten Landsmann, seiner Eminenz, den Kardinal Bischof Humbert, in unsere Mitte. I 
some of what the Cardinal is saying. Something about the freedom of the High Tyrol and betrayal, I think that's what he said. The Cardinal Bishop, he's been shot. I saw it! I saw it! Charles, I must get to Charles. Let me through, please. I must get through. I must find my brother. Oh, don't. Charles! Don't. Charles! Don't stay where you are. I'm coming. Quick, come with me. The crowd's getting ugly, and the sooner we're out of this, the better. Bitte bleiben Sie ruhig. Die Polizei hat den Attentäter schon verhaftet. You better get back to the flat. There's still a way out behind the theatre if you jump Ch to it. Charles, I saw it. We all saw it. It was a bestial thing. They've got the man. That's something. But Charles! It was that tall, black-haired man under the lamppost. I caught a glimpse of him as he fired. He looked like an Italian. There's going to be trouble if he was. Charles, it wasn't him. I saw it. I'll have to get over this fence. I'll give you a legger. That's it. Now, see if you can work your way round to the back of the theatre. The crowd isn't quite round there yet. I've got to get back. <laughs> round to the back, he said... Oh, here's another fence. Oh. I've had a nice stocking, my best. Murderer! Stop him! Stop him! That fair man! Stop him! Stop him, I tell you! He, he came out of the theatre by, by, by a little door at the back. Yes, he's right. oh, yes. What is it in German? Um, der Junge, that's it. Der Junge, das Blond. What is happening? It's you, Miss Hart. Oh, Helmut, thank heaven you've come. This, that fair hat man pushing through the crowd. Oh, look, never mind him. We must get out of here before they start getting rough. Come on. But listen. Come on, my car's just around the corner. Would, would you mind stopping for, for a moment? I, I, I can't... What you need is a drink. <laughs> look, I have a flask here. This will put you right. <laughs> ah, don't go on, drink. Mm. Oh, what is it? <laughs> Schnapps, go on. You won't like it, but it will do you good. I'm, I'm all right now. What were you crashing about in the crowd for? They were beginning to get angry. It was the man. Oh, which man? He was quite young. He had fair hair and a, a, a rather pretty face, you know, sort of weak, but pretty. He was coming out of the theatre. And you suddenly felt an overmastering desire to chase this actor, or was he a pop singer? It's not a joke. The man was a murderer. What? I told you. He was slipping out of the theatre by a side door, and I recognised him. You recognised him? Well, you remember me telling you at dinner last night about that gang of bullies that was beating up an Italian? Well, he was the leader of them. Wait, right, now, let's get this straight. Because you recognised this man as someone you'd seen assaulting an Italian the night before, you came to the conclusion that he had a hand in shooting the bishop? I saw him do it. You saw? No, that's not quite right. I, I saw a gun being pointed at the bishop through a gap in one of the circular windows... The theatre, in, in the turret by the porch. Oh, then what? Uh, a flash? Smoke? I, I, I can't be sure. <laughs> in fact, you really saw nothing at all. You don't believe me, do you? Well, the idea in my part of the crowd was that the shooting was done by an Italian. Apparently he was shouting and waving while the bishop was speaking, then he pulled out a gun and shot him. There was a man, yes. Oh, you saw him then? He was with a group of people under a lamppost opposite where I was sitting. But he didn't do the shooting. That was done from the theatre. By your blonde friend. Well... Of course, I don't know it was him. But if he wasn't mixed up in it, why was he sneaking out of the theatre by the back way? Perhaps he works there and was watching the parade from one of the windows. Then why did he run away when he saw me? Now that, I agree, is quite inexplicable. Now, look, there goes the reservists. Colonel Julius is doing his stuff. Colonel Julius? A uh, Julius Schatzman, otherwise a grey bear, a respected chief of security. Sounds as if there may be trouble. The consulate will be the safest place for you. Stay here. I'll bring the car around. Now, now, would you like me to come up with you? No, I shall be all right. Thank mm. you very much. Frau Rosa will look after me. Now, if you do want me for anything, please telephone me. I shall be honored to, please. <laughs> Here's my card. It has my telephone number on it. You've been very kind. There's just one more thing. You know, I think it would be wiser to forget all you may have seen or may not have seen in the square. Eyes play strange tricks. And your brother did say that you'd been ill. <laughs> Auf Wiedersehen. Goodbye. Oh. 
Hello, Charles. Oh, there you are, Laura. Uh, come in, Doctor. Oh, thank you. This is my colleague, Dr. Pisoni, Italian Consul General, my sister Laura. How do you do? Oh, charm, signorina. Am I glad to see you, Charles. Did you have any trouble getting back? No trouble at all. Schutzman seems to have everything under control. What happened? Well, the crowd tried to lynch the fellow. Albin Boschetto, he's called. The colonel had half a dozen truckloads of gendarmerie in reserve, and they got Boschetto away. But they had to shoot to do it. Who is Boschetto? Oh, he is an Italian from Bolzano. I understand he was released from prison after a three-year sentence for assault and robbery yesterday. He must be mad. Oh, no other explanation is possible. An unbelievable outrage. A prince of the church. And particularly unfortunate that it should have happened when... Yes, yes. When what? Well, Dr. Pisoni was telling me just before the parade. It isn't in the papers yet. But there was an unhappy incident last night not far from Bolzano. A group of terrorists attacked an Italian police station and two policemen were killed. Would Boschetto have known anything about it? Oh. One of the policemen who was killed was his brother. Really? That doesn't tie in very well with your first conclusion, does it? How so? Well, you said he was mad. Well, if he had a brother killed by the Austrian terrorists and got to know about it before it came out in the papers and got hold of a gun and got his own back by shooting an Austrian bishop all inside 24 hours, he sounds to me a pretty smooth performer. Smooth? She means efficient. Oh, see, si, see. Si. And if it was thought that Boschetto had official support in this matter, that it was a reprisal, it could lead to almost any consequences. I thought he'd been in prison till yesterday. How could he possibly have any official support? He'd probably had too much to drink and his friends couldn't control him. They were trying to hold him down. I saw him. You saw him do the shooting? Charles Boschetto did not shoot the bishop. Well, he, he was uh, taken with the gun in his hand. Many people near him saw him pull it out and fire it. The shots he fired went nowhere near the bishop. He was struggling with the people around him. They probably went straight up into the air. But the Cardinal Bishop was shot. If not by Boschetto, then by whom? He was shot twice, quite deliberately, from a turret window beside the portico of the theatre. I saw the gun. You saw the gun? My dear Laura. I saw more than the gun. When I was getting away from the square, I saw the man who had used it. He was slipping out of the theatre by a side door. I not only saw him, I recognised him. Recognised him? And I should be able to recognise him again. You see... I'd seen him before. More pudding, Charles. Charles, dear, more pudding. Oh, uh, sorry, Laura. I was looking at the weather. It's snowing harder than ever now. Maddening that the summer's gone so quickly. I mean, only two hours ago at the parade it was so gloriously sunny. It's not only that. One of our chaps is coming out from Vienna. If he doesn't get stuck on the gross Glockner, that is... Who is he? Well, his name's Evelyn Fines. He used to be at Ankara. What does he do? Well, he calls himself a commercial counsellor. I suppose you mean he's something quite different. Well, actually, he's our cloak and dagger expert. Secret service, do you mean? That's the sort of thing. He's a very experienced fellow. I rang the ambassador to ask for him immediately after I got back to the office. I thought he might be a useful man to have around if anything starts. Anything involving us, I mean. What sort of thing, Charles? Well, I've no idea. At the moment, it's a sort of private fight between the Austrians and the Italians. Dr. Pisoni is taking it very seriously, and so is his government. The border at Zillian and the Brenner have both been closed. Closed? But if the frontier's shut at Zillian and the gross Glockner's blocked by snow, what well, just how does anyone get to Lienz, or out of it, for that matter? Well, there's a lower road to Villach and Klagenfurt. But that gets blocked, too, if we have any real snow. Could you fly? <laughs> there isn't an airfield near Lienz that I'd care to land on. Not in this weather. Uh, Bitte, there is waiting and telephone call for you, mein Herr. Oh, thank you, Frau Rosa. I may clear the table, Frau Leib? Thank you, yes, we're quite finished. And it was a delicious lunch, Frau Rosa. Oh, <laughs> danke schön, Frau Leib. <laughs> Here, let me help you with those. What a shame the snow has come so soon. Yeah, yeah, Frau Leib. Now the summer is gone. The fine weather is over. Oh, danke bestens, Frau Leib. I take away the dishes and put in more wood for the stove. You'd better get your hat and coat, Laura. Why? We're wanted. That was Colonel Julius. Wants us? Well, actually, it's you he asked for. But I think I'd better come along too, don't you? You certainly needn't imagine I'm going alone, Charles. It is most good of you to come, Miss Hart. Mr. Hart. Uh, please sit here, facing us. Thank, Thank you. you. 
Allow me to present two of my staff, Inspector Moll and Dr. Kippinger. How do you do? Well, I... well, I... Now, Miss Hart, you were a witness of the shocking affair this morning. Yes. I understand that you have important evidence to offer. When you say you understand that, Colonel, do you mean that you have had some report about me? Yes, I have had a report. Am I allowed to ask from whom? You are allowed to ask, and I will tell you. It was Mr. Hart's Italian colleague, Dr. Bisoni. If I had wished him to make a statement to you, we should have done it through the ordinary channels. It was quite improper of him to repeat a private conversation. Most improper. But the assassin Boschetto is an Italian-speaking citizen of the South Tyrol. And as such, it is Dr. Bisoni's duty to assist him, if he can. All the same, I... Oh, but we are allowing ourselves to be diverted. Miss Hart, have you any objection to repeating officially... What you have already said unofficially to Dr. Bisoni? No, I have no objection. Ah, well, Inspector Moll here will take down your statement. Well? Um, just before the shots were fired, I happened to be looking at the theatre. There are three circular windows in the left-hand turret. Um, the left hand as you look at it, that is. Yes. As I looked at the lower one, it opened a fraction and I saw the barrel of a pistol come through. What colour is the paint round the window? What? I, I, I'm not sure. Yellow, I think. Why? Uh, you were sitting, uh, uh, what, uh, uh, 30 yards away from the window? Uh, the paint is dark green, in fact. It opened a fraction and you saw the barrel of a pistol coming through. Saw it and were able, in a flash, to identify it. Oh, her name is Hart. How did you identify it? The light was reflected from it. And if light is reflected from an object, it follows that it must be a pistol barrel. I have quite exceptional eyesight. Most exceptional. Did you see the bullets leaving the gun and flying towards the bishop? Of course not. Forgive me, Colonel, but I think you'd be well advised to take my sister's story seriously. She certainly saw something, and it is an odd coincidence that it should have happened when it did. I think it should be investigated. If I did not take it seriously, I should not have asked you to come here. Mm. And the story has been investigated to the best of our ability. I shall hope to be able to convince your sister that what she saw was an optical illusion, an effect of light and shade, not a reality at all. Inspector Mull, be good enough to tell Miss Hart the result of your investigation so far. Immediately after the shooting, I ran across to the center of the disturbance, under the lamppost. Three men were hanging onto a fourth, Baschetto. And Baschetto had actually in his hand an automatic pistol, which the others were preventing him from firing. I took the pistol from him, and after Baschetto had been arrested, I handed it straight over to the head of the police laboratory for testing. Uh, proceed, Inspector. I made a thorough search of the scene. And one bullet was found embedded in the woodwork of the pillar, about eight feet up from the base. I cut out a small cubic section of that woodwork containing the bullet and handed it over to Dr. Kippinger here, who is in charge of our forensic science department. I have the bullets here. Uh, this I designate A. It is the bullet which lodged near the spine of the Cardinal Bishop. It was taken from the body by our pathologist, Dr. Krauss, and you will see that he has identified it by his initials on the envelope. And uh, this one I designate B. It is a bullet handed to me by Inspector Moll. Had he taken it out of the wood? No, it was still embedded in the wood, which it had penetrated in an upward direction. Oh, how do you know that? Our Inspector Moll is a careful policeman, Mr. Hart. When he cuts a piece of wood from the pillar, he marks the top. Oh, I see. I just wanted to know. I then fired a bullet from the gun which had been removed from the prisoner Boschetto. The bullet was fired into a closed box and recovered. I placed it with exhibit A in a comparison microscope and I have here photographs. They are six times enlarged. Uh, come and see. There are marked similarities if you look closely. They do look alike, certainly. In fact, Doctor, you're telling us that the two bullets, one of which was lodged in the body of the bishop, and one of which struck him in the shoulder and ended up in the pillar behind him, that they were both definitely from the gun taken from Boschetto. That is the inescapable deduction. Uh, you must, I think, see the force of this, Miss Hart. I suppose so. 
If the assassin was indeed the man who secreted himself in the theater and fired from the window, as you described, how did he transfer his gun into the possession of a man standing 20 yards away, in full view and in the middle of the square? Couldn't two different guns make the same sort of mark? No, no, no. Rifling marks are as distinct as fingerprints. I reflect also that the first bullet lodged in the pillar eight feet above ground level. Uh, the window is what? Uh, oh, I have not measured it exactly. But should we say ten feet up? For the bullet to have struck the bishop in the shoulder, he must have been about nine feet high. Unless it was deflected. Possible. But unlikely, don't you think? Well... Has anyone looked at the window to see if it has been tampered with? Inspector? Uh, uh, no, no, Colonel. Uh, you, you've got us out, Miss Hart. We attach so little weight to your story that we did not take the very elementary step you have suggested. It uh, can easily be remedied. We will all four of us go along there now. Hop in, Laura, my dear. I'll drop you at the flat, and I have to go and see the Hofrad. Thank you, Charles. You're very quiet. Anything wrong? No. That room in the theatre was so dusty. Stuffy little place. Obviously hadn't been used for years. It doesn't look as if it's been used, but so much dust is... Unnatural. It's as if someone had taken something like, like a vacuum cleaner in reverse and blown a great layer over everything like icing a cake. Hmm, I see your point. And if that's so, there's a considerable organisation at work. To plant a man in that room with a gun that somehow matches the bullets in Boschetto's gun... And gets him away afterwards, spreads all that dust about, and squares the caretaker. <laughs> now, the sooner you're indoors, the better. Got your key? Yes, dear Charles, I have. Go straight in, then, and don't come out again. I'll be as quick as I can. I hope old Humboldt won't keep me too long. What does he want you for? I've absolutely no idea. Sit down, Mr. Hart. Oh, thank you. I gather that you are now convinced that the story being put about by your sister has no foundation, in fact? I'm not sure that I've reached any conclusion on the point yet. You have been shown the evidence. I've been shown some evidence. What other conclusion can there be than that his eminence was assassinated by the Italian Boschetto? I should like to correct the record in one particular. My sister's story, as you call it, is not being put about by her or by me. She talked in confidence to me and to my Italian colleague. For reasons best known to himself, Dr. Pisoni passed the information on to Colonel Schatzman. If anyone has publicised her story, it would appear to be your officials. She has repeated it to no one? So far as I am aware, no. Then how do you account for the fact that one of my personal aides learned of this fiction from Herr Helmut Angel? Uh, I imagine he heard it from Colonel Schatzman or Dr. Pisoni. Within 30 minutes of the shooting. Your Excellency, if you and your police are perfectly convinced that my sister's story is a figment of her imagination, why do you attach any importance to it at all? Do you really wish to know, or is the question a rhetorical one? Yes, I certainly wish to know. Just after midday, a private car drove into the inner courtyard just below here. The driver had a pass and gave the name of one of our medical officers of the health department. The sentry knew no better and let him in. It seems he went straight through and out the other side. By chance, the sentry mentioned his name to the guard commander and he knew that the M.O. in question was in Vienna. The car was examined and it contained a timing device and sufficient explosive to bring down this part of the building. Allow me to congratulate you, both personally and on behalf of Her Majesty's government, on your fortunate escape. Thank you. I gave you this information in answer to your question. We are in a very grave state of emergency, and there's only one thing to be done. It's me at last. Oh, I take your coat and hang it up for you. you. Danke schön. And Mr. Hart, will he belong? I don't know. He's gone round to see the Hofrat. 
Also, there is a gentleman in the front room. Who is he, Frau Rosa? Oh, diplomatic gentleman. His name I do not know. I hope he won't stay long, whoever he is. I'm tired out. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, my name is Fines, Evelyn Fines. You must be the nigger in the woodpile. I beg your pardon? Uh, it is Miss Hart, isn't it? It is. And it was you who put out the story about a hidden assassin in the theatre. I didn't put out anything. I told my brother what I had seen. And I'm not at all sure that I ought to discuss it with you. Oh, I'm all right. I'm on your side. You can talk to me. How do I know that? Well, you don't really. That's true. I might be one of Colonel Julius's undercover boys trying to lure you on to further indiscretions. Mm. Oh, I might be a reporter from the Lienz Herald out for a scoop. If you had been, I don't imagine you'd have helped yourself to quite so much of my brother's whiskey. I need it. I've come fast and far. Like young Lochinvar, who you remember came out of the West. and all the wide border, his steed was the best. Well, I came from Vienna in a pre-war fliver with chains on the wheels. I don't mind betting that not many people got over the gross Glockner after me. Wonderful. What was all the hurry about? You. Why should Vienna be worried about me? Well, to be honest, I don't really know. Like the Light Brigade, I never question my orders, however fatuous. But I gather you're in rather a delicate situation. Have a drink, by the way. Thank you so much. I'd have dined for you, but I expect you know how you like it. And whilst you're at it, a small one for me. Not quite as small as that. Thank you. Please don't give it a thought. A delicate situation, you say? I'm afraid I can't see it. I expect you haven't really tried yet. Ah, yes, that must be it. Humboldt, you know, is three quarters of a great man. He's got patience, drive and imagination. He's a good organiser and he's ruthless. The Austrian government think they sent him out here to get rid of him. I shouldn't be at all surprised if Humboldt didn't arrange the whole thing. Lienz is an ideal base for an unscrupulous man. For months at a time, it's very difficult to get at, particularly if the Italian border is shut. Accessibility, that's one of the drawbacks of your up-and-coming dictator. Oh. Before he's really got underway with his dictating, some interfering person from higher up comes along and calls time. What could he do, Humboldt, I mean? Well, he could move in and liberate the South Tyrol, join it to Lienz, and declare an independent state. He couldn't do that. Who would stop him? Italy. Austria. No, Italy. Well, make your mind up. If Italy moved against him, they'd have Austria to cope with, and Germany as well. There are a lot of Nazis in the Tiroler Bodenbund. But how could he do it? Oh, now you're asking. But it's wonderful what you can do when you get people sufficiently worked up. And there's nothing more calculated to get Austrians worked up than shooting a cardinal bishop. He wasn't... Well, he didn't seem to be a very saintly man. No, he had a rather rough time in the war. I believe he was one of the few men who was tortured by the Germans and the Russians. Oh. Horrible. Either the thing was unpremeditated and Humboldt is grabbing his chance with both hands, or he organised the whole thing. The chap who's supposed to have done the shooting, Albin Boschetto, he was only two days out of jail. It wouldn't have been impossible either to indoctrinate him or to strike a bargain with him. He didn't kill the cardinal. I was coming to that. You could easily be right. If I'd organised a drunken jailbird to shoot at someone, it was pretty essential for him to hit him. I don't think I'd take his marksmanship for granted. So I think I might have a second gun posted in the wings, just to make sure. Then you believe me? I think so, yes. Oh, thank heaven someone does. But it doesn't solve your problem, which is that everyone else in Lienz is not going to believe you. Every time you open your mouth, you're going to be branded as a dangerous agent of counter-revolution. Hey, Charles. Hello, Evelyn. So you got here all right. I suppose you two have introduced yourselves. We have. I ought to have warned you about Evelyn. He's got no manners and he drinks too much. I've got other vices as well. But we've only known each other for a quarter of an hour. Well, it's going to be a case of hail and farewell, I'm afraid. She's catching the midnight train for Rome. Charles! It's orders from the boss himself. What about diplomatic privilege? Well, I wouldn't know, but I'm not arguing about it. I think on this occasion we are going to do as we're told. Whatever happens, she'll only aggravate it if she's here. All right, Charles. I'll go and get packed. Look at that! What? Oh, good Lord, a fire. Hmm, sounds as if things are hotting up. I better go and take a look. Don't get involved in anything. Don't worry, when trouble looms, there are a few people who can run faster than I can. Well, don't tempt Providence, there's a good chap. We need you. He's been gone ages. What on earth can have happened? Oh, he'll be all right. Get on with your dinner, there's a good girl. You have a long journey ahead of you, remember? I'll say I remember. Evelyn, we didn't wait dinner. Hope you don't mind. Oh, that's all right. What was happening out there? It was quite a party. Can I have some of that delicious soup? Of course. Thanks. Well? Thanks. Well, the crowd set fire to the Italian church. Oh, good Charmed. Lord. The police seem to have had orders not to interfere. Not too soon, anyway. 
They fired a few shots into the air to show their zeal. A fire engine arrived and got turned over. And the only person who made any real attempt to keep the peace was Radler. The socialist? I didn't know about his politics, but he certainly got guts. He climbed onto the fire engine and fairly let them have it. What did he say? And told them not to be bloody fools. And to go home before somebody really got hurt. The fire was nearly out by then and it started to snow again. I don't think there'll be any more trouble tonight. I hope not. We've got to get Laura to the station. Stay here, you two. I'll just go and find out which platform you go from. It'll probably say on that notice board. It's horribly cold now, isn't it? Still, it's quiet, that's something. If there's time, we'll get something to warm us up at the buffet. Hello. Has Charles coming back already? Home to bed, my children. There are no trains into or out of Lienz. What? It must have been snowing pretty hard to block the line into Italy. It isn't snow that's stopping the trains. Three span culvert has been dynamited. They reckon it'll take at least a week to repair. Right, Helmut. I'll be there at eight o'clock. Goodbye, thank you so much. Frau Rosa? Frau Rosa? Yes? You know you said this morning when we talked about the man watching the flat that you knew another way out. Oh, yes. Ah, those men. If I wish that they follow me, then I allow them. If I do not wish it, I do not allow. I've just been invited out for the evening. <laughs> so you're going out to dinner? <laughs> yes, that's right. Uh, is a young man? Yes, the, the gentleman who was here the night I arrived. Uh, it will be good for you to go out after being shut up here all day, my Liebchen. Now... When the time comes, I will show you the way out. It is through the apartment of uh, a friend of mine, yeah? <laughs> <laughs> On the ground floor. He is dentist. Well, I'll leave a note for my brother if he isn't back. It's very kind of you to do this for me. Oh, it is nothing, mein Liebchen. You are dining with a young man and you do not wish the police to know. For the police, I have contempt. I, I will see who it is. Hello there. Mr. Keller, how lovely to see you. <laughs> Good to see you. Did you have any difficulty getting in? None at all. Uh, that's the advantage of living in an apartment block. Anyone can slip in with a crowd. Do sit down, cigarette. Oh, thank you. Well, you were right, weren't you, about your nose for trouble? <sighs> oh, that. I have to confess that that wasn't entirely intuitive. We had a tip-off in Rome that there might be trouble when the cardinal came down here. Uh, by the way... Uh, would you care to tell me your story yourself? I, I didn't know it was public property. Oh, it's not as public as all that. I had to pay a lot of money to get hold of it. Well? Well, I've been officially warned to keep my mouth shut. Tell me how much you know already. Well, the story is that you saw someone poke a gun out of a window in the theatre and time his shot so that he was covered by Boschetto. The Italian was just a stalking horse. They needled him into waving his arms and shooting his gun off, but they knew he hadn't a hope of hitting the right man. So they took care to have someone on the spot who would hit him. Well, you might as well know the rest. When I was getting away from the crowd, I saw a man coming out of the theatre. Ah. I'm as sure as I can be that he fired the shots. No one to recognize him? Certainly. Hmm. It's a great story. Could even be true. Of course it's true. The difficulty is they've examined the bullets and there's no doubt that they came from Boschetto's gun. You could fake evidence like that. How? Well, Boschetto had been jailed, right? Yes. You know he's got a gun hidden somewhere. And you know he'll go and pick it up as soon as he gets out. Maybe you have the hiding place under observation so as to make sure he does pick it up. It's quite possible. But you've been there before him. Had the gun out, fired two or three bullets through it, and preserved them. You bury one of them in the frontage of the theater. Well, how do you know where? You're organizing the parade. You know where the bishop's going to stand. He can't leave the microphone. How do you know where Boschetto's going to be standing? My guess is they got at his friends. Only someone else had seen the gun. Someone else did. 
Oh, for goodness sake. Uh, not a human eye. The eye of a camera. He was being oh. photographed from half a dozen angles. Cine cameras, telescopic lenses, a lot. I had maybe a couple of hundred negatives brought to my office. Most were focused sharp on the speaker, but in one, the focus had slipped. The bishop was a blur, but there was lots of lovely, sharp detail of the theater. Did you notice anything? I didn't look at it closely because I hadn't heard your story then. But I seem to remember that, that one of the windows, uh, the lowest in the left-hand turret, was open a small way, and something was projecting. That's proof, then. Boy, oh, boy. If we could get that photograph, we could put it on every front page in the world. It might be an interesting exhibit at Boschetto's trial, too. <laughs> it might be that. Can you get hold of it? It was in the first batch that arrived. I know that. I've only to find the name of the photographer. What are you going to do with it? I'll find some way of getting it out. Come to think of it, though, it mightn't be a bad idea if you were clear of the country before it appeared in the world's press. And curiously enough, the very same thought had occurred to me. Dear Department, the situation here has deteriorated since my last telephone communication on Thursday. The destruction of the culvert at Garvas is generally attributed to Italian saboteurs. This, coupled with the snow which is still falling, has isolated Lienz almost completely from the rest of the outside world. Herr Radler, leader of the socialist opposition in the Landtag, has been placed under protective custody. His offence, apparently, was haranguing the crowd that was burning the Italian church. Further reserve forces have been called up and camps are being formed in the region of the Italian frontier, ostensibly for road clearance. A military tribunal is being set up to try Boschetto. Oh, hello, Evelyn. Hello. Get any lunch, Charles? Oh, good Lord, no. Been doing my homework. Now, how this is ever going to get out beats me. What have you been doing? Oh, wondering about. The average Lienzer simply doesn't know what to make of it. The young Austrians are solidly behind Humboldt, are queuing to join the security force, getting issued with armbands and truncheons, and going around looking for people hit on the head. Sounds like Berlin during the putsch. Obviously, Humboldt means business, but I don't think anybody knows quite how far he intends to go. Does he know himself? I'm not sure. He could be a thoroughgoing Nazi-inspired pan-German fanatic with backing from Munich and Bonn. Mm, or he might just be mad. Mm. Oh, incidentally, my Italian colleague, Dr. Pisoni, decided to surface this morning. Did he indeed? What did he want? Well, he dragged me off to the prison while he interviewed Boschetto. Interesting, was it? Well, at first it was just the stereotyped question-and-answer affair. Yes, Boschetto had been well-treated after he'd been rescued from the crowd. Yes, he'd heard about the death of his brother. and seemed remarkably unmoved, I thought. Mm. He agreed that he'd been carrying a gun for his own protection. He said many people in Austria did the same. What else? Well, this is the interesting bit. He's been given a lawyer to help him prepare his defence. Apparently, this character has advised him to speak with absolute frankness about his accomplice. Has he an accomplice? Well, he wouldn't say. But I rather think that was because I was there. Uh, what's the time? Quarter to eight. Oh, good heavens. We must be getting back to the flat. Laura will be wondering what's happened to us. I'm glad you were able to get away. I feared your brother might forbid it. I haven't seen him since breakfast time. I don't see why he should object to you. What an incredible place this is, Helmut. Oh, you like it? I'm glad. It is one of my favorite places, the Winter House. What is it exactly? Well, it's a private club for people with the same enthusiasms. Uh, sailing in summer, skiing in winter. I noticed the lake as we came by. Incidentally, what a magnificent drive you are. Oh, thank you. I have a fine car and that is half the battle. Only half, Helmut. When we went into the skid on the ice, I thought we'd turn over. You were frightened? <laughs> not exactly. Exhilarated, I think. It was not really dangerous. I was showing off, I'm afraid. Hans! Hi, dear. A brandy for you, Laura? Lovely. Well, then, Hans, we'll have two glasses of brandy. Uh, two large glasses. Yeah, my dear. That man over there looks like a ballet dancer. He moves so lightly. You like ballet? I love it. In fact, I used to go to ballet classes when I was at school. <laughs> so English schools... <laughs> You learn dancing, music, to brush your teeth three times a day, <laughs> but neither your school teachers nor your mother's teachers, the only thing that really matters. And what's that? That a girl should be made ready for love. Tell what you're exaggerating. I assure you I am not. Ah, here's our brandy. 
Prost. <laughs> Prost? <laughs> what do you mean exactly, made ready for love? Well, I mean that a girl should be taught that she's been given a body for two purposes. For making love and bearing children. That is a biological position. A civilization has added complications. Marriage, for example, is an extra. <laughs> Like ballet dancing and milk after supper. Oh, you see, your mind is still at school. <laughs> there are, of course, women who have never made love. Mm. They are to be pitied. Like children born with one arm. How sad that is. How very, very sad. Do not look so tragic, my pretty Laura. Come and dance with me. I'd love to. Only my legs, they feel a bit wobbly. Mm, that need not worry you. You are a dancer, ballet dancer. You told me so yourself. Come along. Could we go back and sit down now, please? Oh, I certainly. It, it's terribly hot in here, isn't it? There seems to be a disturbance outside. Excuse me for one moment. I must get out of here. I don't like it anymore. I feel dreadful. I'm sure I noticed a door here somewhere. Oh, yes, thank heaven. This staircase must lead somewhere. Just a lot of doors with numbers on them. What an odd room. Nothing in it but a sort of telescope. But there's no window. What can it be for? Oh, we, it's focused on the table where we were sitting. Has Helmut come back? He looks rather bothered. What else can I see? <gasps> Fair young man. The one who murdered the bishop. I must get out of here. I must get out. Can I help you, Fräulein? I, oh, quiet, quiet. You are very pretty, Fräulein. I will find a quiet room for us. <laughs> Evelyn! Let her go of her! Evelyn, be careful! That's quiet in him for the moment. Now, quick, out of the window. Don't dither. It's not a long drop. Car's over there. Come on. I'm going to be sick. There's no time. They'll be around here in a moment. Get in. There's a chap running down the steps. Hey, you catch! Ah, oh, there you are, Laura. Sleep well? No, I didn't. I've a filthy headache, if you must know, and I feel as though I've been put through a mangle. I can't say I'm surprised. I suppose I ought to be grateful to you. <laughs> There's no actual rule about it. Some people do feel grateful when they've been saved from making thundering asses of themselves, but mostly they don't. How was I to know Helmut was on their side? Well, you first met him when Humboldt brought him to dinner here, didn't you? Yes. You knew he was an active member of the Tiroler Bordenbund, didn't you? Yes. Well, then whose side do you expect him to be on? Well, he seemed rather nice at first. In fact... Just the sort of man a girl does like to be taken out by. Depends on the girl. What do you mean? Well, I'd have thought even you would have realised by now just what he is. Well, yes, I think I did towards the end. When we were dancing together. And another thing, do you know who his current boyfriend is? Of course I don't. Hans Krimmer, your fair-haired friend, the chap you saw coming out of the theatre. Oh, no! Anyway, I still don't see what the object was. If he didn't want me, why did he take me out? Try using those small pieces of cosmic jelly sometimes referred to as your brain. You, my good Laura, represent a danger to the state. The state, just at this moment and until the snow melts, is Hofrat Humboldt and Colonel Julius Schutzmann. They've gone to a lot of trouble to produce a certain situation, an important part of which is that Boschetto should be guilty of murder. His trial starts in two days' time, and you turn up out of the blue and threaten to give evidence against them. Well, in the old days, they'd have dropped you into an oubliette until people had forgotten all about you. As it is, they've got to discredit you somehow. And that was the object of last night's manoeuvres? Of course. What was it, that awful place? Well, I can only call it a pale carbon copy of the notorious green house outside Berlin. What was that? The German Secret Service thought that one up. Object blackmail. All sorts of tastes catered for and recorded with a concealed camera. How disgusting. 
And, and what was meant to happen to me? Well, it depends how tight they got you. You'd have ended up in one of those little upstairs rooms. How did you know where I'd gone? I bought the information. I still can't think why they didn't follow us. Well, I took the distributor arms out of six of the eight cars. I couldn't get the other two, but it probably took them some time to find out which was which. Where did you put them? I threw them, but the chap was running after us. Anything else you want to know? Horrible. I'm glad you got out of it all right, Lauren. Serves me right, Evelyn says, for having been fool enough to trust Helmut. Obviously, you hadn't realized quite how far all this has gone. Briefly, what they want to do is shoot Boschetto and march into the Tyrol in that order. Only you're standing in the way of step number one. I haven't done anything yet. No one's even asked me to give evidence. The trouble is, such a lot of people have heard your story. It's going to look pretty funny if you don't give evidence. I'm beginning to wish I'd never come here. I wouldn't go along with that. If you hadn't, I'd never have met you. Thank you, Joe. All the same, I think it might be a sound idea if your brother made arrangements to get you out in the fairly near future. You think it's as bad as that? I should say that however bad things are now, they'd be bound to get worse when the American and European papers start featuring your story. Have you managed to get it past the censor? No, oh, not yet, no. I'm planning to take it out personally. The man whose offices I use, nice chap called Santos, um, he's hiring me a car and some skis. Nothing wrong, am I taking a skiing holiday in the Dolomites? Will people believe it? Will they publish it? They will when they've seen the photograph. You've got it! Oh, I'm near to it. It was taken by a local photographer called Hoffracker. Guess he knew he was onto something good. It's costing me 500 pounds in Swiss currency. Why Swiss? I can only surmise that Hoffracker plans to be in Switzerland himself when the story breaks. I'm um, off round to his place now to pick it up. Take care of yourself, Laura, my dear. Goodbye, Joe. Joe. Be seeing you. Well, that made a nice change anyway. Sandoffner, are you there? Come in, Herr Keller, come in. <sighs> you look upset. Did it not go according to plan? Not exactly, Herr Sandoffner. When I got there, the studio was empty. Everything had been burned. Photographs, negatives, the lot. And Hoffracker had been murdered. Murdered? His body was hanging from a hook behind the door. But his neck had been broken from behind. What did you do? There was nothing I could do for him. So I sneaked out again and made my way back here by a roundabout route. I wasn't sure whether I was being followed or not. Someone brushed against me in the darkness, but it was a child and he ran on. When I got into the elevator to come up here, I put my hand in my pocket and found this. Hmm? Poor Hoffracker must have guessed they'd be after him. So he did this to make sure I'd get it. So this is the photograph. Yes. Yes, it is very convincing. Well, I don't imagine that the police will attempt any official action. They would fear the publicity. They must know that if this photograph appears in a single foreign paper, it blows them and their schemes sky high. Possibly they will have seen the negative. In any event, they will go to great lengths to get it back. An organized brawl or a knife in the ribs? Yeah, yeah. Skip the details. But not, I would guess, before tonight. These things go better in the dark. So you had better go now, Herr Keller. Yeah. I have arranged all, the car, the skis, in the name of Peter Marker. I have even a visiting card in that name. Here it is. Who is Peter Marker? Oh, a rather objectionable young man who joined us last year to report the international ski events. That's fine, Herr Sandelsner. I can never thank you enough. We... Uh, we are not all bad, we Germans. Some of us still believe that truth should prevail. Goodbye, Herr Mauger, and go with God. Quarter to ten. Everyone's very late this morning. What can have happened to them? Good morning, Gerhard. Ah, you are here, Herr Consul. Certainly I'm here. May I point out that it's now a quarter to ten? Ah, 
My regrets that I'm late. I have been round to find out what's wrong with the typing stuff. And what is wrong with them? Gertrude has a migraine. Rosa has boils. Hmm, I'm sure they'll be all right in a day or two. I suppose we get on with opening the post. Uh, but first, Herr Consul, may I must tell you. Tell me what, Gerhard? My cousin who works at police headquarters, he tells me that an American criminal yesterday committed a murder in the Oberlin suburb. An American criminal? Uh, he has been masquerading as a newspaperman. He's killed a photographer called uh, Hofwacker in his shop. It is thought there was a dispute about... Uh, money in an endeavor to conceal the crime, he set fire to the shop. Do you happen to know his name? His name was Keller. Keller? Well, that's very interesting. I presume he's been arrested? No. He escaped the police. And the gendarmerie seemed to have no orders to stop him. Oh, we'd better see what they want. Yes, the consul. The vice consul is here. Yes. Well, Mr. Hart. Yes, sir. Good morning, Inspector Moll. What can I do for I you? I have a message from the Hofrat. You are to accompany me immediately to government headquarters. Well, well. I'm always at the disposal of the whole class. You will wait in here. In a few moments, the Hofrat will see you. I wonder what Humboldt's up to now. The office had been searched last night. That was obvious. In fact, they hadn't troubled to hide their traces. Good day, Herr Consul. Good day, Colonel Schatzman. Is it you or your master that I've been brought here under armoured escort to see? The Hofrat asked for you. Asked is one way of putting it. But I am glad you've arrived in good time, since it enables me to have words with you first. I have reached an age when all I seek is a quiet life. <laughs> oh, I shall deny this if you repeat it. But between ourselves, I consider the South Tyrolese are very happy as they are. And I do not think either side will find any advantage in the coming Anschluss. You speak of it as a certainty. Well, let us say a distinct possibility. But the point of my remarks is this. Where a prize of that magnitude seems to be within the reach of a man like my master, he will not be scrupulous in disposing of obstacles. Your sister is an obstacle. I fail to see it. So many people have now heard her story. So many more people will soon hear it mm -hmm. that if we fail to call her as a witness at the Boschetto's trial, it will be imagined that what she says is true. And if Boschetto is not found guilty, the spark will be lacking. The people will not march. I fail to see what I can do about it. Oh, uh, a proposal will be made to you. I urge you most strongly to accept it. It is my official duty to do so. But uh, if you are quite unable to do so, I might be able to suggest an alternative. Oh, come. We must not keep the Hofrat waiting. I take it that you know this murderer, this uh, American journalist, Keller. I have never met Mr. Keller. He appears to have been on friendly terms with your sister. He, too, came here from Rome. You may be right. Is it important? In the light of the latest developments, it is. What developments are those? Yesterday, the assassin Boschetto made a full confession. It was planned in Rome. Boschetto was selected as a simple-minded patriot with a grudge. He was given a gun immediately he left prison, and also a great deal to drink. He must be a very simple man to perform in front of a crowd of witnesses an act which must inevitably result in his own destruction. Quite so. The plotters in Rome had arranged for an accomplice to be present. An accomplice who would swear that Boschetto was not the killer, that the shooting was done by a mysterious unknown assassin concealed in the theatre. In a word, Boschetto's confession has made your sister's part in the matter all too clear. If you have any independent proof of this outrageous allegation, I should like to see it. We have no time for independent proof. Boschetto's trial starts tomorrow. We have, however, prepared a short statement for your sister to sign. Having done so, she may leave the country. I can assure you she will sign no such statement. Then Boschetto and your sister, being accomplices, will have to stand trial together. That is the only alternative. Why shouldn't I sign this confession of theirs? I could always deny it afterwards. It isn't only that I'm against signing things that aren't true but I'm far from certain that they'd keep their part of the bargain. Once they'd got your confession, they'd think up some reason for keeping you here and putting you on trial too. 
What do you think I ought to do, then? You've got to get out without Humboldt's kind help. Evelyn's out now, seeing if he can make any useful contacts. It's no use getting you out of the flat unless we can get you out of the country, too. Equally, it's no good finding a way out of the country unless you can get me out of the flat. I expect we shall think of something. Hello, Evelyn. Any luck? I think I can say so, yes. I've just come from the police station. What? I was pulled in on a trumped-up charge and had a most interesting little chat with our old friend, Colonel Julius Schatz. I regret any inconvenience you are being caused, Captain Fiennes. Don't mention it, my dear Colonel. I always wanted to see the inside of a prison cell without actually having to commit a crime to do so. You've not lost your sense of humor, I see. I wish to discuss with you the highly unfortunate situation which has arisen. Unfortunate for who? For Mr. Hart, and even more so for his sister. The notorious assassin. It is not a matter for joking. That's where you're wrong, Adia. Miss Hart is an assassin, or even being remotely connected with assassins is so ludicrous that even poor Frat Humboldt must find it difficult to stop sniggering when he suggests it. Young girls do foolish things. They don't shoot bishops or even help other people to shoot them. In the present atmosphere, people will believe almost anything. Quite so, but how long can you keep the pressure up if a court should fail to find Boschetto guilty? Oh, there is little doubt about the verdict of the court. But not no doubt at all. Suppose the court says we've all heard some story about a shot fired from the theatre. We'd like to postpone our verdict until the lady in question has given evidence. What do you do then? Postpone the invasion of the South Tyrol? Hmm? You can't keep your chaps hanging about forever on the border, you know. They'll get chilblains. You are an intelligent man, Captain Feintz. But although you state the difficulties with great clarity, you do not suggest any solution. Have you got a solution? Yes. I have. And had he? He had indeed. At six o'clock tomorrow morning, Laura and I are to leave by the back entrance. My car will be parked round the corner. Colonel Julius says he can arrange to have his own men actually on guard at the time, but it must be before the guard changes. He can't guarantee their successes. Why would he do that? Well, it's a sort of compromise. He wants Laura to slip off quietly without making a confession. Then people will think that as she's run away, she's thought better of it, and the trial can proceed. Is it Schatzman's idea or Humboldt's? According to Julius, it's his own idea. He says he's certain Humboldt wouldn't agree to it. Humboldt wants a full confession, signed, sealed, and delivered. Do you believe him? <sighs> it's a terribly difficult question. Vienna may be quite determined to stand no nonsense from Humboldt, and Julius would know this. He controls communications and intelligence, and he'd know that the Tyrell putsch would be a flop. And once he knew that, you can bet your life he'd swap horses. On the other hand... Yes? Julius may be in this body and soul, planning to get Laura out of the flat so that she can be picked up trying to escape. That would save an international incident. And which idea do you think is correct? I think the Colonel's playing this one straight. Straight with us, that is, and crooked with Humboldt. He's been backing both sides of the board and laying off his bets for so long that it's second nature with him. Laura? Yes? You're taking the main risk. What do you say? I'm willing to try it if Evelyn is. Right then, six o'clock tomorrow morning. Put on plenty of warm clothes. So far, so good. Yes. But did you see who was in that car? Which car? Past us, going the other way as we came out of the side road. It was Hans Krimmer. And I'm certain he saw me. So am I. Did you see who was driving? No, I was looking at Krimmer. It was an old friend of yours. Handsome helmet. They were warned the police posts. Now, the posts have been fixed. What they'll probably do is to turn round and come straight after us. Helmut fancies himself as a driver, doesn't he? Oh, yeah, I, yes, I believe he does. <laughs> Don't worry. It's only good drivers who have crashes. I'm far too bad to come to any harm. Fifteen miles to the first post. Here goes. Luckily, no one could go very fast on this stretch. Is it like this all the way? More or less. The road keeps to the left bank of the river. So long as we keep to the road. What did you say? Nothing. What happens when we get to Oberdraberg? Well, we go straight, they let us, and on to Mountain. But I doubt if we shall get that far. Why not? Well, the Plurkin Pass has been snowed up for weeks. We leave the car in Mountain and find a man called Rudy who will take you across into Italy. Look. What? No, 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 don't look. What's the matter? There's another car behind us. I'm pretty sure it's Helmut's. Damn and blast. I thought we'd dodge them. You sure? Yes, I can see it now coming up fast, too. If I had a car like his, I could drive fast. Could we get off the road and up into the forest? No, they'd see our tracks in the snow. Can you still see them? No, they're behind that dip at the moment. Right, I'll pull her off the road. <laughs> These logs. Help me heave them onto the road, will you? I might stop them. That's it. 
Here she comes. Heavens! Gone over the edge. And it's a 500 foot drop. I don't care about Grimmer. Sorry about Helmut. Well, we better think Stu and be sorry. Help me put these logs back as near as possible like they were. Why? Well, it may have escaped your attention, but we've just written off the ruler's right-hand man and the right-hand man's number one boyfriend. We're not out of Lienz yet. If you want to be charged with double murder, I don't. That looks all right. I'll shovel some snow on top. Yes, and if I roll this boater down onto the road, it'll look more like an accident. Pass me that stick to Lee Ridge up, will you? Thanks. Now then. Now, get back in the car. We've quite a way to go. Take a look at that. That Italy? Frontier runs along the top of that ridge. How far? Six or seven miles, the crow flies. If we were crows, we could be in Italy in about half an hour. An inspiring thought. What do we do now? Park the car and walk to Rudy's farm. We should be all right if the snow isn't too deep. What happens if it is too deep? You have a remarkable flair for asking unanswerable questions. Presumably we shall sink into it and stay there in a state of suspended animation until next spring. When the snow melts, they will find us clasped in each other's arms. I can hardly wait. Oh, come on. We haven't got all that much time. I don't think I can go much further. It's only another mile or so, according to the map. Just a minute, listen. Quick, lie down. Keep still, it's a helicopter. Do you think they saw us? I don't know, I don't think so. Thank God for the trees. If we'd been in the open, they couldn't have missed us. Now, come on, we've got to hurry. I can't go any faster, really, and I can't. We've got to get undercover before that flying mousetrap gets back. Look, you can see the roof of the farm. It's all downhill now. Thank God for that. Wake up. Rudy's back from the village. It's time to think of the last lap. I brought you some soup and a glass of wine. <laughs> What's up? Well, it's you. First you drag me up a mountain to the side like the monstrous bully you are. Then you sit on the end of my bed like an old family doctor prescribing chicken broth and a glass of red wine. <laughs> I'm a man of many parts. Talk to me while I eat this. Are you coming with me, by the way? As far as the frontier, yes. And I shall go back and hold your brother's hand. Do you enjoy your job, Edith? Not very much. But intelligence works anything I was trained for. I do thought it was fun. Well, the novelty wore off. I didn't volunteer. I was drafted into every damn silly outfit in the army. I was dropped out of aeroplanes, landed from submarines, went for long circular tours in the desert. Oh, it might have been fun to start with, but I was never very brave. And any courage I started with had evaporated long before the war was over. Courage can't evaporate. I'm telling you the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Now, why I should bother, except that you look so curiously attractive, lying there with your hair like a bird's nest. If we start talking for a single moment, you'll find me right in there beside you. What was I saying? Um, you, you were talking about courage. Oh, yes. Courage. That's what people don't realize. My courage, you can use it up. It's, it's like the capital you inherit when you're 21. You think it's going to last forever, but it doesn't. Once you've used it, it's almost impossible to replace. What is it, Rudy? I'm a medical fraulein, but can you get ready now? Yes. I thought you weren't going till dusk, Rudy. It is my son. He saw you arrive. And my wife has just told me he ran down to the village. I fear he's raising the alarm. I did not know he had seen you, or I would have locked him up till you were gone. He's an active member of the Bund and quite untrustworthy. Armored car. Sounds if like he's managed it. Blast him. Off you go. I'll keep on bear as long as I can. So long, Laura. Come, Fräulein. We'll go the back way and through the wall.
parachute troop. 12th Regiment, 2nd Airborne Division from Vienna, Major Ansbacher. Captain Fines, and am I glad to see you. The 1st Division has already taken control of the ends. Our orders are to disarm certain irregular troops which have been formed in the frontier area. I'm sure you won't have any trouble over that. I wonder if you could spare a few men to go after Miss Hart. The Consul's sister, the lady all the newspapers are speaking of? That's the one. I didn't realize she'd got with the papers. Though. In all the papers, it will be a pleasure to help. You have to hurry. She's had quite a start, and she's got the best guide in the Tyrol. Joe, it was good of you to come and meet me at Tom Letso. Couldn't let the heroine make a solitary entrance into Rome, now, could I? <laughs> <laughs> Here, take a look at this. A photograph. An awful picture of me. Oh, it's the snap I gave to a friend in Rome before I left. They got a town in the article, all right. Listen. Alone and threatened by the powers of a police state, this English girl stood up for the truth and vindicated it. More. By her courageous stand, she delayed the plans of a dictator and gave the central power in Vienna time to restore control. Goodness. The safety of the South Tyrol lay in her small hands, and she did not let it fall. <laughs> <laughs> well, Laura, honey, we'll be in Rome in a few minutes for a civic welcome, and after that... Yes, Joe? Will you do something even more heroic? marry a newspaper man? <laughs> I can think of nothing I'd like more. Darling Joe. That was Prunella Scales as Laura Hart in After the Fine Weather, adapted by Cynthia Pugh from the novel by Michael Gilbert. The rest of the cast was as follows. Colonel Schatzman, Philip Lever, Joe Keller, Ronald Wilson, Boschetto, Michael Goldie, Charles, Charles Hodgson, Hofret Humboldt, Malcolm Hayes, Helmut Angel, Gabriel Wolfe, Dr. Pissoni, John Baddeley, Frau Rosa, Elizabeth Morgan, Evelyn Fines, Peter Howe, Sandholzner, Frank Partington. Other parts played by members of the BBC Drama Repertory Company. The play, which was recorded, was produced by Betty Davis. The news follows after the chimes of Big Ben in half a minute. Ten o'clock. This is the BBC Home Service. Here is the news read by Peter Barker. The American professor freed by the Russians is now in London. He's said to be very tired and nervous. Argentina's decision to cancel foreign oil contracts has brought demands by Washington congressmen for full compensation or an end to American aid. Two Labour MPs have strongly attacked trading stamps, which should be exchangeable for cash, they said. In today's soccer, the three leaders in the first division all lost their matches. Parts of northern England have had thick fog, and there's a possibility of more at first tomorrow. Elsewhere, showery weather is likely. Professor Frederick Barghorn of Yale University who was expelled by the Russians today after being held on spy charges, got to London Airport this evening. But he had nothing to say to a big crowd of British, American and French reporters. He just shook his head and smiled. 
Escorted by 13 policemen and one policewoman, Professor Barghorn was taken to an American embassy car. He went off to spend the night with friends. He may leave for the United States tomorrow. In Washington, a State Department spokesman denied that instructions had been given to prevent reporters from interviewing the professor on his arrival from Moscow. He was a private citizen and he could talk to reporters or refuse to talk to them as he saw fit. A spokesman for the American Embassy in London said the professor had told them that he did not want to say anything at all about his experiences. He was tired and nervous and all he wanted was sleep and rest. But he had said it was sure good to be out. The Russians had given Professor Barghorn little notice of his release. He was handed all his personal effects in a sack and soon afterwards was driven to Moscow airport. There, one of the two security men with, whom, with him shook him by the hand and said in English, Goodbye, pleasant journey. The first news of his release was given to the American Chargé d'Affaires in Moscow by Mr. Gromyko, who said that it was because of the personal concern expressed by President Kennedy. Our Moscow correspondent says the Russians have still not said why Professor Barghorn was arrested, and they're not likely to. He was a close and well-informed observer of Soviet affairs, and Soviet security officials may have felt that he was pressing certain inquiries too hard. Our Washington correspondent reports great satisfaction in America over Professor Barghorn's release. But he says there is no feeling of triumph in official quarters that it was brought about by President Kennedy's strong stand against the arrest and the furious reaction it provoked in the United States. Congressional leaders in Washington want American aid to Argentina cut off if American oil companies do not get compensation for the cancellation of their contracts. Senator Mike Mansfield of the Democratic Party called the move a serious blow to relations with the Argentine. The Republican leader, Senator Dirksen, said it undermined the confidence of potential investors in Latin America. The State Department agreed that compensation was the key point. They would wait and see before deciding what action to take. In Buenos Aires, police have been posted at the headquarters of foreign oil concerns, foreign banks and embassies to prevent disturbances. Experts from the state oil concern have been sent to foreign oil installations to keep production going. The contracts, which were mainly with American companies, were negotiated in 1958, when President Frondizi was in power. But the new president, Dr. Elia, made it clear before he was elected that he would cancel them. Two Labour MPs spoke out today against trading stamps. Mr. Francis Noel Baker said at Dagenham that the trading stamp was an old trick, used at least 60 years ago. It was all based on the childish, something-for-nothing confidence trick. But now British advertisers had called in huge American reinforcements. If the stamps were really worth money, the housewife should have the right by law of cashing them on the spot. This demand was also made at Maidstone by Mr John Stonehouse, who said the stamp craze was becoming a national scandal. The circulation of millions of stamps was tantamount to the issue of a second currency. Two places in the Midlands have been without bus services today because of strikes. At Derby, corporation bus crews came out in protest against new duty schedules. They say they'll strike again tomorrow and on Monday morning as well if the schedules are not withdrawn. At West Bromwich, it's been the second day of a 48-hour unofficial token strike by the town's busmen who are demanding revision of a shift and bonus agreement. The men say that when they go back to work tomorrow, they won't drive on routes beyond the town boundaries. The new Greek government, headed by Mr Papandreou, have released on parole 15 political prisoners who've spent more than 10 years in jail. The Greek Siemens leader, Tony Ambatielos, is not among them. He's serving a life sentence on charges of helping the communists during their revolt after the war. The government say more prison prisoners are to be freed in the next few weeks. There are still about a thousand political detainees in Greece. The TUC delegation, which has been visiting Yugoslavia, has arrived back in London. It went to Yugoslavia mainly to find out the part played by trade unions there. But its leader, Mr George Woodcock, 
said they were still considerably puzzled. Yugoslav trade unions worked on an entirely different system from those in Britain. An eight-year-old Plymouth girl, missing from her home at St. Budo since seven o'clock last night, has been found dead in a field about two miles away. The girl, Janet Taylor, of Borringdon Avenue, had been at her grandmother's house watching television. She had only to cross the road to get home, but disappeared on the way. The police are treating it as a case of murder. In today's soccer matches, the first division provided the biggest shocks. The league leaders, Sheffield United, were beaten 1-0 at home by Bolton Wanderers, but they stay at the top of the table.